Hi, I'd like to start by asking you to close your eyes. Think about how your body is functioning right now. Take a deep breath. Your lungs are pumping air in from the world around you and sending it to all your organs. Your heart is beating. Your muscles allow you to run and walk and lift things. So much goes on in living bodies. What I find most incredible is that your neurons are firing constantly and managing input from 37 trillion cells all over your body and then sending signals back to them. We're all carrying giant switchboards and call centers around with us in our brains, along with hands and music and memories. And the same thing is happening in humans and animals all around the world. You can open your eyes now. Another marvel of biology, and you can see me. Many of you are management students, and you may be wondering, why is this wildlife biologist here to talk to us? I think my job here is to be a voice for wildlife and to invite you to join me in exploring some of the lessons that watching wildlife can help us learn. Nature manages itself all the time, and it has managed to persist for billions of years, somehow resulting in giraffes and whales and ostriches and insects all on the same planet with us. You did not just come into existence. You're not just the product of your parents. You're the product, together with all of the animals in this, uh, on this planet, of billions of years of evolution. I think by paying attention to our natural environments and how to, to how animals behave, we can learn a lot about ourselves. And in fact, we already have. There's so much we know about how humans function because we have animals to learn from. I'd like to share with you a slightly different take. I'm not going to talk about how dragonflies inspired the invention of helicopters or how snakes inspired medical robots that can move through blood vessels, though all of these are amazing and existing inventions. I am going to share with you how animals um, and watching them have taught me so much about myself, how I use time and energy and what makes me happy. I've been watching animals since I was a kid. And eventually I made that my job. I studied butterflies and how they interact with flowering plants and snakes. I helped track a king cobra's movement as part of a study. And birds, like this giant bird, the Malabar pied hornbill that we find in the Western Ghats of India. All of these animals use different strategies to deal with life and with the environments around them, both in terms of their evolution, like birds that have evolved wings and humans that have evolved to walk on two feet as well as in their daily lives. For the past eight years, I have been puzzling over the daily life of hummingbirds, and I want to share with you some of what they taught me. Hummingbirds are tiny birds. The smallest one weighs the same as this old 10 paisa coin. This is a bee hummingbird that's found in Cuba. You and I have backup energy stores in case we don't get food for a few days. We'll be fine. But hummingbirds don't have much of a backup source of energy and they use energy super, super fast, and they also have to stay light in order to be able to fly. They use up energy so quickly that if we, we used energy at the rate they do, we'd have to eat about 600 packets of potato chips every single day in order to stay alive. So they have to manage their budget of energy very carefully in order to stay alive, and they have to feed every few hours during the day, otherwise they would die. It's like having a limited financial budget, you would plan your money very differently if you had a limited budget compared to if you had an unlimited budget. So what I really wanted to know was how do hummingbirds spend their energy and their time? What do they spend it on? It's so limited. So I studied how they use their time in their natural environment and I found that they are very, very flexible in how they use their time based on what's going on around them. So if there's a lot of food available in a very small area, they can just sit in the same place and feed and sit and feed and not spend very much energy or time flying. But if their food is very sparse and it's distributed throughout their environment, they have to spend a lot more time looking for that food and feeding and a lot more energy on it. So they're very, very flexible in how they use their time. 
Learning this about them, I started wondering, am I using my time efficiently? Am I working enough? Am I more efficient when I'm really rigid with my time or when when I'm very flexible with my time? And if I can collect all this information about animals, why not do it about myself and learn something about myself in the process? So I tracked my time. Every 15 minutes or every time I unlocked my phone, I would enter what I had been doing with my time. And I know it sounds really tedious, but it doesn't take all that much energy. Um, So I did this for about 880 days. That's almost two and a half years. And I found that I spend about 5% of my day, which is about an hour a day, on exercise. I have to state a disclaimer here. This was pre-COVID. Since COVID started, I've been quite a couch potato. Um, But hummingbirds spend between 3 to 13 hours a day on flying and hovering on exercise. Um, This is just a little bit more than me, I know. Um, So the little energy ninjas. I also learned that I was being quite inefficient in how I used my time. So I thought I was working enough hours in a day, but I wasn't making progress on what was really important to me. So by tracking my time, I realized that I was spending most of my working hours on administrative tasks and not enough on really important things that were essential to my longer term development. So I started consolidating my time and I started spending only a limited number of days in a week on administrative things, like say two hours, two days in a week. And the rest of the days I would focus on longer term important things. I also started using a co-working website so that I would have external accountability to finish those tasks. And I found that really helped me prioritize some of the more important tasks over what was what just felt like urgent, smaller tasks. Next, I tracked my mood. I was living in Alaska for about a year and a half. That's a state uh, in the US that's northwest of Canada. I was living only about 300 kilometers away from the Ar- Arctic Circle. So the days get really, really cold, like minus 30 degrees Celsius cold. And... They get very dark in the winter, like only about four hours of daylight in the, win- in the winter. In the summer is the opposite, about 20 hours of daylight. So I was there to study seasonal depression because a lot of people, especially women, get very depressed in the winter when there's so little light available. Now, I'm from Chennai, from tropical, sunny Chennai, and I could only help but wonder, would I be getting depressed in Alaska? So I started collecting data on my mood. For about uh, 1,028 days, twice a day, I entered whether I was happy or sad uh, in five different levels of of mood. I also collected uh, notes on whether it was sunny or cloudy and other factors that I thought would influence my mood. Because it's easy to think that we know ourselves really well, but I felt like collecting data every day would help give me a daily view as well as a big picture view on what my mood was and how it what was what it was influenced by. So the idea was what makes me happy. And what I learned was that on average I'm a pretty happy person. I uh, out of the five categories that I entered data on, which were extremely happy, good, meh, bad, and terrible, I spent most of my time in the good category. And um, I'm happy when I get to dance regularly, when I get to be outside in the forest. But what I realized really influences my mood is my progress at work. So if I'm happy with my partner, I'm exercising enough, I'm uh, going outside enough, then what really influences my mood is my work and my relationship with my work could uplift or ruin my mood very quickly. And this includes my relationship with my supervisor, my progress on deadlines and things like that. So this is where time tracking really helped me optimize um, how to spend my time so that I could be happy on that dimension. I've been professionally animal watching for the past 12 years and what it has really taught me is to pay better attention to how I interact with the environment and the world around me. For example, Alaska summers were much, much harder than winters for me. and That's not something I didn't expect and collecting data helped me understand that. In your lives, there are a few levels of awareness that I would love for you to have going forward. First, How do you use your time? And are you spending it on what's important to you? Are you doing what makes you happy? If you are, that's incredible and I'm very happy for you. And if not, maybe take a step back and think about what you're spending your time on. Uh, Maybe make a budget for your time like you would for an event or uh, for your monthly expenses. 
At the next level, I know that many of you will go on to work in established companies or established companies of your own. And I'd like you to pay attention to the environmental impacts that your work is having and that your company is having. We would lose so much enrichment in our lives in so many ways if we lose more of the natural space and life that we've been losing at the rate we've been losing it at. The air we breathe will be dirtier, the water will be murkier, and the world will be darker if we lose our wildlife. We would not exist today without nature sustaining us as it has been for so long. So in your chosen paths, please be open to what nature is telling you and try to give some good back to her. There are many, many, many more lessons we still have to learn from her. If we just listen. Thank you.